and good morning. Uh, my name is Karolina Vigura, and I am a member of the board of the Cultura Liberada Foundation. And I have the pleasure and honor to be the chair of the today's seminar. The seminar uh, will be uh, devoted to the long-term consequences of uh, the enlargement of NATO, focusing mainly on Sweden and Finland, but not only. And uh, this is a part, uh, a next part, a subsequent part of a series about the long consequences of war in Ukraine that Cultura Liberalna, together with the Polish-German Foundation, Cooperation Foundation, the Frit Ort Foundation and the Zeit Foundation, have started to organize in March 2022. Uh, we, I, I would like now to, to cordially welcome our speakers. Uh, they will be uh, in the order of their appearance uh, on the floor of our today online, uh, online seminar. Andreas Umland. Uh, Andreas Umland is uh, an analyst at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and Associate Professor of Political Science at the National University of Kiev Mohiwa Academy. Uh, we, we also uh, are joined by Leila Alievo. Uh, Leila is an affiliate of Russian and East European Studies at University of Oxford um, School of Global and Area Studies. Uh, we are also joined by Alexander Shushko. Alexander Susko is the uh, executive director of the International Renaissance Foundation, which is based in Kiev. And last but not least, we are also joined by Maxim Trudolyubov. Uh, Maxim Trudolyubov is senior advisor at the Kenan Institute and the editor at large of Medusa. He also was the editorial page editor at Vedomosti. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I will now uh, like to, to give the floor to Andreas and listen to your take on the long-term consequences of the current NATO enlargement. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Although I'm based at the Stockholm Center uh, for Eastern European Studies, I will not that much speak about um, Sweden here. I, I think, in fact, that uh, this enlargement in terms of the geopolitics of Europe is not that important because both Finland and Sweden were close allies of NATO and did not that much um, change. Therefore, I think uh, their, their accession to NATO, therefore, doesn't change that much in the, in the structure of Euro uh, European geopolitics. Um, I think there were, there were or they are um, uh, already under informal protection uh, by NATO member countries, and they um, are, of course, members of the European Union and therefore protected by the uh, uh, the article in the Treaty on European Union also um, w uh, via the European Union. Um, maybe the one thing I wanted to mention here in the accession process, which I think is um, uh, interesting, um, is that Finland started earlier the discussion about uh, this accession in December 2021 in response to the um, uh, to this announcement from Moscow that Russia would be against uh, a northern enlargement of NATO and um, that Finland uh, reacted to that uh, in exactly the way that perhaps Russia did not want and did not expect, namely that um, exactly such an announcement then um, uh, triggered um, a new wave of the earlier discussion we had in uh, both in, Swin in, in Finland and Sweden before about a NATO accession. And uh, this Finnish discussion then led uh, to, um, uh, you know, a public debate that more and more uh, uh, pointed towards um, a soon accession of, of Finland. Um, in Sweden, that was slightly differently. Um, here, the um, the major event was um, the major, the large Russian invasion, uh, official open invasion on 24th of February. And he combined with the Finnish discussion about uh, the, the older Finnish discussion about uh, an accession to um, NATO, then this, um, uh, the Swedish debate uh, changed um, to, and uh, we, in spite of the uh, neutrality uh, tradition in Sweden, and uh, this sort of self-identity of Sweden as being uh, non-aligned, um, the, the, combi the combined um, 
debate in Finland about accession and the effect of the invasion on 24th of uh, February then uh, led uh, Sweden to follow basically the Finnish example and then both of these countries uh, combined their efforts. Um, but as I said, um, I don't think it, it actually changes that much in the uh, geopolitics of, um, uh, of Europe. And, uh, you know, I, I want to know whether what other people think about this. Uh, maybe they have uh, different opinions. Uh, what I think um, is here the most interesting um, aspect of this is uh, the um, impact that uh, should or that th this accession will should or will have on the Western debate about the sources of the conflict, because um, with the accession of Finland, um, the argument about a possible Finlandization of uh, Ukraine becomes, of course, uh, uh, strange. Or you know, what do you mean now by Finlandization, which has been um, over 30 years uh, a rather popular term? Uh, partly even within uh, within Ukraine uh, to uh, to conceptualize the uh, Ukrainian security sit uh, situation, and uh, also I think this uh, northern enlargement so quickly and so suddenly in response to uh, Russia's uh, first rhetoric and then actions uh, should also have an impact on um, the popular debate. Um, uh, concerning NATO's role in um, the um, escalation of uh, tensions in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, here, uh, the main protagonist of this uh, sort of argument has been John Mersheimer. And, you know, one, one, should, one should challenge him on, um, on the events th uh, that uh, are now happening in Northern Europe. Why does the logic that he sees in Eastern Europe, namely the um, NATO enlargement in Eastern Europe and then the 2008 membership perspective for uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, why, does, why does this trigger a war in Eastern Europe, um, a major war in Eastern Europe, but an actual accession to NATO, not just, not just a membership perspective and a doubling of the uh, Russian NATO border with the accession of Finland? Um, why does that not trigger also a major escalation in, in Northern Europe? I mean, we. I think most most of the people mm -hmm. now watching this and and here assembled here have, of course, the um, um, the answer to that. The problem here being that um, in in German that sounds better than in in English. Um, so, for um, my, my argument in, in in German language was usually that the problem with Finlandization of Ukraine that for uh, for Russia for Russland. Um, uh, uh, Ukraine is not Finland for Russia, um, for Russland, Ukraine is Russland and not Finland. And therefore, Finlandization is not possible. And what um, what Russia wants is a Russlandization of, uh, of Ukraine, which um, it never wanted um, in Finland. So um, I think that uh, that is something that should be explored. And uh, I think that should be uh, more thematized. Uh, Mersheimer has just been to the European University Institute in Florence and once, once again voiced this, uh, this theory that NATO's enlargement has triggered um, the war. Um, and uh, I think what, uh, what needs to be done now is to basically actually uh, use the, uh, the developments in Northern Europe to, um, to highlight also what, uh, what the difference then between Northern Europe and, and Eastern Europe is and why there is a war in Eastern Europe and no war in, um, in Northern Europe. Thank you so much, Andres. And at the same time, I would like to, to, to pose a question already, because I, I found the perspective uh, about the, 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 the Marheimer uh, opinion on uh, the Eastern enlargement of NATO. And now, with in comparison to, to, to their reaction now to, to, the, to the enlargement by Sweden and Finland, fascinating. And I started to think, do you think this is more about certain ideas of what the West actually is? Or this is about some certain stereotypes about Eastern Europe? That it probably shouldn't have been the NATO in the first time. What is it about? Where, where does the, 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 the difference in, in interpretation of the situation comes from? 
you mean on the Russian side or on no, the side? no, in, in the in the in the Western side, in the, the in the reaction to to the the whole concept of enlargement. Where do I, where does the 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 Merzheimer's idea that that the Eastern enlargement could have triggered Russia's uh, reaction could come from? Well, one would have to ask him. I mean, I I can only speculate. I think that that has to do. Uh, a lot, perhaps not not so much with Eastern Europe or, um, and views of Europe, but with his sort of theoretical framework, offensive realism, uh, which sort so sort of leads him to make these conclusions. In an earlier book, he ha he had made the conclusion that uh, what Europe should now, uh, after the unification of Germany, really fear is the rise of Germany in. Um, uh, in Europe, and you know, Germany as a new threat uh, to in as a new superpower in um, in in Europe. I mean, you know, this this is difficult to comment on because it it's it's basically a deduction from a theoretical model that is then applied with I would say little regard for the mm -hmm. actual empirical um, things on the side. Um, uh, the uh, historian, Princeton historian. Uh, uh, Stephen Kotkin had had answer has answered mm -hmm. to to Mershama saying that you know if you know the, the history of Russian imperialism you don't need any any international relations theory to to know what you know what is happening in Eastern Europe now this is uh, there's nothing new here and uh, to apply any any sort of of theory is in a way unnecessary because you you just have, can extrapolate what what happened in the past uh, to what's uh, today and then then you are ready. Uh, with a good explanation of what is happening today. Yes, yes, so, he, um, he actually said in one of the interviews. Maxime and, the... And, and, and Alexander, they can comment on this from, from their perspective. I would be very interested. Yes, I will be very interested also to, to hear your comments. Uh, Stephen Kotkin, uh, actually in one of the interviews said that there was no NATO 70 years ago, neither in 19th century. So it's it's an interesting argument actually, um, and uh, and I would like now to 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 give the floor to to Leila Alieva, and uh, uh, please Leila take the floor and and share with us your insights about the enlargement of NATO, possibly also uh, touching on the points that Andreas already mentioned. Sure. Uh -huh. In this regard, I am uh, solidarizing with the arguments of Andres, and I do think that NATO enlargement as a factor of Russia's uh, sort of uh, um, irritation is rather an excuse. Although there is a serious school of thought, uh, and we know there were uh, books published on this matter, how important that was NATO enlargement. But from the very beginning, I would say that the, the very term NATO enlargement is already quite um, ambiguous uh, because you can put it two ways. One is NATO enlargement and the other joining NATO by the new states. And I think the second is um, more neutral. And also the NATO enlargement discourse is a bit of a trap which imposes a real political logic. So if you speak about enlargement of NATO in uh, geographic terms, I think it definitely uh, sets a certain um, a discourse and which um, makes Russia to respond in the similar way. But I think it's, again, it's just an excuse. And um, as you both, uh, Karolina and Andreas, already mentioned the arguments against that. Um, so it was not an essential reason for the crisis in Russia-Western relations. And uh, from my point of view, there are two major uh, factors which will determine uh, the long-term impact of uh, NATO um, enlargement. Uh, one of them is, of course, the outcome of the Ukrainian-Russian war and what will happen to Russia. Um, whether, um, you know, I think um, 
uh, Russia. There, there might, there will be a certain situation under which Russia will stop using the uh, NATO enlargement as the excuse uh, for its aggressive behavior. Um, and um, on the other hand, I think the new strategy of NATO announced in Madrid shows that NATO is extending its view on, you know, mission, nature, and future of NATO. And it's overcoming the geographic boundaries, which is very important, because so far we've seen it really very tied to geography in terms of Euro-Atlantic um, uh, alliance, but not really going beyond this geography. But we already have seen in, for instance, point 44, I think, of the new strategy that they are planning to uh, sort of go as far as uh, to the other parts of the world and to get engaged with these countries, probably not immediately to offer them membership. But I think because NATO has two aspects, one ideational or values and the other the physical or um, geographic or physical uh, hard power element of defense, um, I think um, this, uh, the, um, the uh, idea, the, the element of values uh, will have to uh, make, uh, on the one hand, NATO expansion, <laughs> let me use this term, which I, <laughs> I am not very much in favor of, but uh, both um, uh, overcoming geographical borders on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, more uh, inclusive uh, and probably uh, multi-layered or multivariational, as EU is trying to become now, to offer various uh, types of relationship, depending on how the uh, the ideational factor is developed. And um, so that that's how I would like to stop now. Leila, and if I can ask one more question, because you have said, uh, you have you have pointed at the, the, the difference, the development of the NATO's view. You have said that NATO is extending its view. However, uh, we have all observed the behavior of Turkey and um, Erdogan uh, concerning the, the, the current enlargement. Could you please also com comment on that? To what extent um, to what extent NATO um, is, um, is a community, is an alliance that can survive the differences in values and interests that have been visible um, um, regarding exactly to this, to this um, to the arguments of, uh, yeah. of where the government has been. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is actually the uh, substantial difference of values here. It's mm -hmm. the uh, difference between, uh, in terms of state interests, and state interests, you know, uh, on the one hand, NATO is asserting the uh, importance of territorial integrity and sovereignty. On the other hand, you know, there are countries, according to Turkey, which hosts the groups which are armed or they are supporting the armed groups in Turkey, which is basically undermining the sovereignty. So it's not so much, I think, uh, about the values because uh, uh, generally speaking, of course, there, there are various trends. I mean, we, we uh, watch these... Um, uh, sort of decline of values both in the EU, but it's a general trend, right? In the EU, in Hungary, in Poland, we see the decline of values. And I think it's more general issue. It's not just which is specific to NATO. It's both global and it's both the issue of all the multilateral institutions, which are uniting uh, the allies uh, and partners uh, in European geographic and transatlantic ge geographic space. And I think it should be, of course, uh, 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 be uh, resolved as a part of the broad issue. I mean, Turkey's current behavior, I think it's more in short-term perspective, not in the long-term perspective. I think Turkey is trying to bargain to get the best uh, 
kind of uh, uh, case out of this uh, benefits for uh, itself. Of course, Erdogan has domestic problems and that's also related, but I think it's a much broader issue, which both EU and NATO will have to deal with. Thank you so much, Leila, uh, for this. And I will now ask uh, Oleksandr Sushko to take the floor. Oleksandr, are you with us? Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. Thank you, everyone. I'm really glad to see so many of you, uh, my familiar faces. Some of you we have not met for a long period of time. And thank you for inviting me to join today. Yes, this is, a, um, I think, uh, the NATO is one of the elements of this big puzzle, a big crisis, and we all hope the new rise of the Western institutions, which we... And certainly there is a very lively debate here in Ukraine with regards the steps of NATO, uh, both to support Ukraine and also to include new member states, to accept new member states, Sweden and Finland. All these issues are very important because it gives us a huge, I would say, space for, for analysis, for debates, for, uh, for understanding of what's going on uh, in, this, in this significant institution. Uh, and here uh, I would uh, mention at least few elements, at least three elements, which are important from the Ukrainian perspective. One of them, which is usually mentioned by, by people who analyze uh, the overall trends in the Western democratic community that these steps of, of NATO is a part of return of the West as, a, as an actor, the big West democratic community. So I remember just a year ago, a year and a half ago, the major motto in the Munich conference was Westlessness, if you remember. So, and that was very worrying uh, term because is, it has identified the deep crisis within the West, deep crisis of new senses of the willingness to defend, to lead, to, to set agenda and to, 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 to provide a leadership. So that was a very worrying element. And certainly uh, Russian aggression has identified uh, at least some visible signals that West is going to revive. At this moment, we do not. We are not able to foresee to what extent this revival will be sustainable. But this is already something which already happened with consolidation of the Western resistance to Russian aggression with the support to Ukraine by various means. And the NATO takes its, its own role in, in this support. And certainly uh, acceptance of new members is also quite significant step because for NATO for a long time, it was really a difficulty to accept new member states as far as we remember previous accessions took long, really, really long time. I remember, for example, for, for, the, for the Macedonian, our Northern Macedonia, it took 20 years from getting membership action plan to accession, 20 years. And some other countries, it took maybe less, but also significant period of time. Now we, we see that that can be different on various reasons, but again, this fast process identifies that these Western institution may act decisively and in a fast manner when it is needed and when there is a consensus on that. 
So the second, uh, the second element of the picture is, is uh, related to the perception of neutrality. Andreas already mentioned this concept of uh, Finland model, Finlandization as a, as a concept which existed before. And uh, in many circles here in Ukraine and other countries, it was a popular idea that a neutrality can be a instrument of effective protection of sovereignty and territorial integrity. So this uh, experience of uh, such countries as Finland, Sweden, also Austria and Switzerland, some other cases, was quite popular to say that, look, there is not only uh, the NATO is not the only game in the town. So there are other options, alternative options, which are also efficient, which can be taken uh, where Ukraine and other countries of the Eastern Euro may borrow relevant experience. Now the situation says that neutrality is no longer relevant. So there is there is no, no, this argument has already disappeared with accession of Finland and Sweden to NATO. And so there is no, no longer illusions that some sort of non-allied, non-bloc, non-NATO policy can be a viable alternative to accession. There is no longer this, this argument. So this is why the succession is also quite important, which help us to identify where we can find the possible arrangement, uh, post-war arrangement, which would be desirable uh, for, for, for Ukraine. The third element is the, uh, they said, which I already partially mentioned, that fast accession is possible. I mean, uh, there was, um, long-term standpoint by the NATO that the only way to join NATO is first to apply for membership action plan, then get it, and then have it several, at least several cycles of membership action plan, then assessment, then uh, decision to invite this country, and then accession. So it was a clearly stated by, by NATO that this is the only way. And this, uh, this was uh, uh, really the part of the reality for 20 years, since 1999, when the membership action plan as an instrument was introduced and it was offered to various countries, many of them successfully accomplished its procedure, this procedure and became NATO member states. Again, this is no longer the only way. So uh, the, the experience of Sweden and Finland says us that if there is a political will available, if there is a strong need uh, which is acknowledged by member states, the accession may come even without membership action plan or any other transitional instrument uh, for preparation. To, to membership. So certainly there is a, it doesn't mean that this fast track is available for everyone, but in theory it's available. And this is a big change when it comes to the perception of how to become NATO member state. So I think this is also significant uh, change which affects the debate on NATO enlargement, NATO accession in Ukraine and the other countries. Uh, around. So I think that these are these three elements which are, in my opinion, the most significant when it comes to Ukrainian perspective. Thank you. Alexander, may I just uh, ask you one more question? You have yeah. spoken uh, quite a lot about perception of the debate about the enlargement of NATO. Uh, to what extent um, you would say, uh, looking into the opinion polls in, in Ukraine, to what extent there might be a popular sentiment or a popular um, conviction uh, in Ukraine 
uh, that if um, the, the way to the EU has been at least partially opened to Ukraine and Moldova, and if uh, Finland and Sweden have been uh, practically accepted to NATO, then, then Ukraine and, and Moldova should also become uh, future member states, already, uh, member states of NATO already. Thank you for the question. First of all, there is overwhelming majority of Ukrainians who support NATO accession for Ukraine. It's according to various polls, it is between 65 and 75 percent of those in favor of, of NATO accession. Some polls even identified up to 80 percent. But average average support is 70, 75 percent as a, for, the, for the time being which is quite significant. I can tell you that as compared, as compared to the year ago, it was 45%, and 10 years ago, it was 20% for NATO membership. So it's a, it's a big change suddenly, and this is a, it demonstrates to what extent people are uh, hoping for. So, so NATO is a, is a source of hope for Ukrainians to be protected. And this is also the acceptance, acknowledgement by the public opinion that there is, there are no um, equal alternatives. So there is, there are some alternatives, but they are not so much trusted. NATO is trusted as an instrument which can protect uh, peace, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. To what extent it is uh, available, certainly people may not know uh, so many things, but what people know that the Russia, uh, one of the demands uh, of Russia uh, was to drop or to, uh, to uh, remove NATO accession from the agenda to accept some sort of neutral non-allied status. And the question will be, for example, if there will be at certain point a peace deal draft of the peace deal on the table. Either uh, Ukrainian society will support something which would replace, for example, NATO accession to by the some sort of, of neutrality. At this moment, this option is, is not supported by, by the society. Uh, certainly, we cannot foresee what happens after if, if the war takes long time. But at this moment, again, the society, this is not so much about NATO neutrality dilemma, but this is a reality when people just do not trust to any kind of proposals by Russia. So there is no, no, no confidence as neutrality or non-blocked anti Ukraine already have been in that. So when I just reminding you that when Russia annexed Crimea at that time, Ukraine was formally non-aligned, non-bloc country. It was fixed in the legislation. So yet it did not prevent it, annexation of Crimea and beginning of the war in Donbas. So the, the, the very concept of neutrality is discredited already in 1914. So that is why people are, do not have this hope uh, of uh, of um, of neutrality as a replacement of NATO enlargement, and that is why people are still even understanding that this is not uh, available in a short term perspective. But they see that practically it is possible. And here, coming back to accession of Sweden and Finland, there is one more argument for people here in Ukraine that if there is a need, if there is a political will, the exception, accession may happen just within a couple of weeks or months. It's possible. Mm -hmm. So that is why we, we have to understand that one of the strongest effects of accession of Sweden and Finland is that Ukrainian society have seen how it may happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm always thinking when there is collective hope, there might also appear collective resentments when the hope is not fulfilled. 
Uh, and uh, but I think we'll come back to that, Maxim. We asked you uh, initially to to present the uh, the, the twofold reactions uh, to to the uh, to the enlargement of NATO, namely, firstly the Russian propaganda, and secondly the Russian opposition uh, or Russia independent media. Uh, would you please take the floor and and familiarize us with that? Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so um, I will, I will say, th basically, I'll, I think I'll make three points here. Um, the first, actually, about the the way um, the NATO enlargement, uh, the NATO enlargement is seen from Russia's perspective. Uh, then um, I would say domestic effects and uh, some international. And number three, some international effects outside of Europe, which I think are quite important. Um, so um, what happened is that um, the invasion, the full scale invasion, as it was say, phase two of Russia's war against Ukraine, uh, that happened uh, four or five months ago, um, is, a, is probably one of the most is the biggest, uh, greatest uh, strategic blunders um, ever made, at least for the past 30 years, I think, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it is seen as such, not just by the Russian opposition, but uh, by many in uh, the loyalist circles around uh, Vladimir Putin. It's quite, un it's quite well understood that this has been a major, major mistake uh, based on terrible information, um, bad, bad assumptions uh, on um, probably the, this, the very system that Russia is in a sort of personalist uh, autocracy or authoritarian regime that's based on leadership of one person, it itself, its, its very structure leads to misinformation, window dressing, all kinds of things because everyone is only responsible, only accountable uh, before their superiors. So you, you have every incentive to, to create all kinds of fictions uh, and uh, window dressing for your superior. And that's what happened. And Putin was fed uh, bad information. What happened basically is that um, he's declared goals like demilitarization, stopping NATO enlargement, they've been essentially uh, broken. Um, he's got the exact opposite of what he's been hoping for. So Ukraine is now militarized and will continue to be so. Um, uh, NATO, of course, is in the process of uh, a continued enlargement and it, it doesn't look like it will stop at this stage. Um, Russia, which I think is a major, major factor, is essentially losing its uh, long-term connection to Europe through its uh, so-called energy, I would call it a, the energy bridge that has been in place since the early 70s. And it's been a project primarily between Germany and uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia, but not just Germany. Germany has been probably the premier partner in that, and uh, that was part of this political strategy that's existed up until perhaps February 2022, um, uh, for essentially 50 years. So Putin has been instrumental in dismantling this uh, political structure, political economic structure that's been, uh, that's been underlying uh, the Soviet Union and then Russia's relationship with the West and essentially with the West I and mean, Western Europe, essentially uh, and built on the idea of uh, building uh, economic interdependence that is supposed, supposedly, as we know, sort of since the Enlightenment is supposed to lead to peace. It does not lead to peace. Uh, so now it's a, it's a major question hanging in the air. Does inter economic interdependence work? Um, so basically, Putin's got the exact opposite of many, many, I, I won't even mention, there's a long list. 
So everybody understands this mistake. Still, he is in power because of the kind of system that um, he himself created. It's very difficult to unseat him, despite the fact that most of the mm, kind of internal parties around him, the inner circles, uh, they are mostly unhappy what's going on. So there are people who are unhappy on, let's say, on the right side, there are people who are unhappy on the left side, but it's a long story. I won't go into this right now. So basically the, the one, that's point one, point two, very short. Uh, domestically, uh, what happened basically is that Putin used his invasion to uh, continue and probably finish uh, uh, essentially killing Russian society. He has reformatted it. Um, he has finished off all independent media. Uh, almost all, I don't know, 99% of uh, independent non-governmental organizations are out. Most international foundations organizations that used to operate in Russia freely up until February are gone. Uh, businesses, obviously, uh, many, not all of them, by all means, but many, uh, more than a thousand large businesses are out. And um, so essentially, um, today's Russian society, from the point of its, let's say, governability in authoritarian sense, is, uh, is, is much more manageable, governable than it, it was five months ago. So in a way, this is one aspect of this whole story where Putin, we can say, is kind of successful. That's probably the only area because he's got what he wanted in just five months. Um, and number three, I wanted to point out that what happened is that um, by unleashing this war, uh, Putin has created lots of opportunities for um, actors outside of the West, the kinds of opportunities that barely existed before. And if we look at players like, first and foremost, China, uh, but also Turkey, um, Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan to a point, uh, Iran, Putin has just been to Iran, talking to the Ayatollahs and uh, discussing buying some weapons from them. So basically what we have is that we have a new set of actors, all those countries with their own interests and all kinds of various uh, agendas. They've got um, an entire new uh, space opening up in front of them because Russia is getting weaker. And um, one very important aspect probably overlooked is that uh, strategically, um, uh, Putin and his circle, they've been basing Russia's, um, uh, Russia's uh, role in, in, this, in, in the region in a wider sense on Russia's unpredictability and, its, um, and fear of its so-called second most pow powerful army in the world. Uh, on its agility, on, uh, on the Kremlin's ability to make decisions quickly, um, do things like annexing a territory as a matter of three days. So that kind of created a, a vision of, of Russia that is 10 feet tall, sort of. Big army, big force, terrible, fearful. Uh, this invasion has demonstrated to, to the world, to everyone, that Russia is not 10 feet tall. And Russia's army is as problematic as everything that uh, Russia has. And uh, Russia is challenged technologically and economically, financially. Russia is much more integrated in the world than, um, than Putin probably wanted, and uh, it has shown. The sanctions are biting and will uh, be a major, major problem uh, going forward. So basically what we have now is that Russia is leaving uh, 
gradually leaving the kind of vacuum in the region and probably in the greater region uh, that other players, other actors are eager to, to fill in. And I mean, look at Turkey. Turkey is uh, trading with uh, Russia, talking to Putin. Turkey is trading with Ukraine, selling weapons, particularly uh, Bayraktars and some other weapons. Uh, Turkey is playing its own, its own game in the Middle East and is dealing with Russia and Iran uh, on Syria and other matters. Uh, it's doing like a, it's playing, Erdogan is playing like a, uh, is a kind of a multidimensional chess every day, essentially. Uh, it's, it's not even, even, you know, sitting on two chairs. I think there's like three or four. Um, same goes particularly first and foremost, by the way, for China, uh, who is not that visible in the region in terms of the news, but it's very much in the game. And uh, China is considered uh, Russia's ally, well, not ally, but sort of China is not opposed to Russia's war against Ukraine. But uh, China is not opposed to Russia's war against Ukraine, not because it's, it wants this, wanted this war, is for this war, probably, I would say no. But uh, obviously China is very much interested <clears throat> in seeing to what extent the West could be weakened, what extent they could use the opportunities that are created uh, against the United States in the first place, but also in the region as well, because potentially China can see lots of openings um, uh, in the markets that are being left right now empty in Russia and the region. And uh, it will, I'm sure, use all those opportunities uh, going forward. Right now, already, China is a major beneficiary of uh, the trade wars, the energy wars that Russia is engaged with <clears throat> with the West. So China is getting more oil and gas at discounted prices, as does India, by the way. I haven't mentioned it, but sure that. So basically, we have, and Kazakhstan, obviously. Kazakhstan is also very important. Uh, Kazakhstan is uh, the country that is uh, sort of has been up until very recently uh, Russia's major major ally. It's part of the collective security treaty organization that Putin's answer to NATO uh, sort of. Um, but we see uh, these relationships uh, with Russia getting more and more complicated and uh, during the St. Petersburg Forum, as probably some of you heard, uh, Takayev, the president, he <clears throat> was quite outspoken in terms of um, Kazakhstan not, be, not being able to recognize any of those new, new uh, so-called republics, self-proclaimed uh, LNR, DNR. Uh, so, um, and he was, he was very adamant in keeping his independence, uh, proclaiming his sovereignty uh, in the face of Putin himself. And uh, he's Kaz under him, Kazakhstan definitely is going to use every opportunity that is that presents itself, mostly economic, but who knows. But right now it's, it's mostly the economy. Takayev has called on uh, all those businesses that left Russia to come to Kazakhstan and open up so there so these things are starting to change so we see a number of actors I've, i haven't mentioned azerbaijan but that's also a very important player in the region so russia has created i mean putin has opened uh, a pandora's box of of sorts um in um, so that this entire part of the world is in flux right now and um just one probably concluding thought is that as opposed to Russia Western relations, particularly Russia against NATO, these kind of relations, which, uh, which have a very strong value element in them. Um, well, because the West is 
all about values. And NATO is not just a military alliance, it's also an alliance of uh, countries that subscribe to a certain set of values. Whereas the countries that I've mentioned, from China all the way to Kazakhstan uh, and uh, Turkey and the rest, these uh, players, they live in a value-free world. They act value-free. They're opportunists. Uh, and uh, so we, we see the world that is essentially splitting, I think, uh, into parts. And one of, one of the parts is uh, a, a world that is, tree, is still value-based, uh, a world where values matter. And that part, the other part, which Russia continues to be dealing with and open with and it's not as isolated from it. Russia is not isolated from China, from Turkey, from Iran, uh, Kazakhstan, etc. This is a value-free world and it's different. And um, it's um, full of opportunities and uh, actors who are sitting on two or three or four chairs. So that's um, how I would conclude my remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maxim. This has been fascinating. And I would like now to, to ask you for, um, for your comments and questions. The first comment or question uh, comes from Andreas Umland, but I do hope that, uh, that also I will see other raised hands. I would very much like to, to ask Leila, um, because Andreas, I, I think, is going to talk about Moldova. But uh, Maxim also mentioned Azerbaijan. Uh, this is not our direct point of, of interest today because we are talking about the enlargement of NATO. But as it has been mentioned, I would like very much to, to ask you, Leila, about it. And, um, and then I also see a raised hand of Eugeniusz. So let's, let's have now uh, Andreas and Leila, if possible, and then Eugeniusz. Yes, thanks, Carolina. As you mentioned in your uh, response to Alexander Moldova, I, I was just reminded that this is actually a, a good additional example to uh, what we're talking here about. Moldova, as you may know, uh, adopted a new constitution in 1994 and defined itself as block free in, in Article 11 of this constitution and has basically done what many are recommending to Ukraine uh, to declare it itself block free and as Alexander mentioned there was until February um, um, a sort of section of uh, the Ukrainian elite that was also basically uh, proposing something like that and proposing that as a as a solution but um, uh, and also 1994 Moldova and Russia concluded a treaty about the withdrawal of the remnants of the 14th Russian army that had intervened in 1992 in the inner Moldovan conflict but as you know, um, uh, these um, so-called, I think, operational group of the Russian Federation is still in Moldova at the um, ammunition, uh, um, uh, the, the sklad, the, uh, the, the storage, ammunition storage um, place of Kovbasna in Transnistria. And the interesting thing here is also that uh, Russia has itself not recognized uh, the uh, Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, so-called. And so it's against the will of um, the government in Chisinau stationing Russian troops on the territory of the uh, officially recognized uh, territory of Moldova, even officially recognized by, by Russia. And this it just illustrates once more the, the, the point about the, uh, the non-starter uh, or uh, NATO, NATO enlargement as a non-starter, as an explanation for uh, what is happening in Eastern Europe. So we have a lot of variety here, if, if you want to put it in social science terms, on the independent variable. We have Moldova as a, as a non-aligned country. We have uh, Georgia and Ukraine as um, countries with a membership perspective. Or we have Estonia in 2007, when it was already a member, uh, suffering from a cyber attack by, by Russia. And or we have, you know, uh, Finland in 2021, not yet um, uh, seeking accession, being warned against it. Now Finland is becoming um, a member of NATO. 
and, and Russia is fine with that. And so we have a lot of different situation here with regard to NATO from, from Moldova, basically with a constitutionally defined um, neutrality up to now uh, Finland um, and Sweden entering NATO. And, and basically the, the Russian reaction to all of that doesn't seem to be related to, um, uh, to actually the different stances of, uh, of these countries on NATO, whether they are in NATO, they want to get into NATO, they are outside NATO, they are neutral, they are, you know, the, 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 the Russian reaction is, is, is no, in no correlation to, this, uh, to these different developments and different stances of different countries. And that's why I thought um, mentioning Moldova here was actually quite, quite useful. Although I expect now perhaps to also change um, uh, a change in Moldova that perhaps they will change even the constitution and also uh, start seeking uh, NATO accession. Leila, would you well, would you take the floor now? Uh, the question was about um, Azerbaijan as a as a player uh, in the vacuum that Maxim has uh, described as a consequence of the war uh, with Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, in order no. to understand Azerbaijan's position, you have to go a bit <laughs> further back. Um, uh, in the 90s, there was a huge uh, enthusiasm about reorientation or what I called reshaping Eurasia. And, you know, Caucasus, particularly Georgia and Azerbaijan played a key role in this reshaping. So it was related to energy projects, it was related of getting rid of all the Soviet troops first in Azerbaijan before it was even done in Germany. So um, there was a very strong enthusiasm of reorientation from Russia to the West. The problem started when these countries uh, became punished for their pro-Western orientations. So uh, Ali Vashivarnadze was strong enough, but also Russia was more liberal at that time, the Yeltsin was there, uh, but they sustained a few assassination attempts, um, I think as a reaction to this um, attempt to reorient and to uh, go to alternative, initiate and support alternative uh, energy projects, transport transportation projects, and in general cooperation with NATO and EU. Um, so gradually the countries um, understood that nobody's gonna really uh, work or play the role of counterbalance to Russia if Russia decides to attack or do something nasty. It was confirmed in 2008. And it was also, and war, current war in Ukraine is the perfect example of how the country is left vis-a-vis um, -vis Russia uh, without sort of the troops in the ground or something like that. I mean, there were two approaches which NATO could apply in the 90s. One of them is accelerate maps and accession process for these countries, which appeared to be impossible, as we know, in 2008. Uh, but there was also an alternative project, mainly supported by the US, uh, the Guam project. So basically creation of the local regional security organizations, which would strengthen capacity of the newly independent states to uh, counter Russia's, um, you know, uh, security threats coming from Russia. So this was a very unique organization and I was supporting it in my publications and everywhere because it was the only organization which was coming from below. The initiative was coming from below, not imposed by Russia or EU or any other organization. So it was, however, it was not, I think fully understood uh, the importance of this organization was not fully understood as, uh, and its uh, importance, uh, because if, if it turned into a, a serious uh, defense organization, security defense organization, probably Ukraine would not have to fight Russia alone uh, today. Um, so these countries, four countries of Guam, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, and Ukraine had similar uh, concerns, security concerns. And that was, they were punished for their pro-Western orientation by Russia, 
through supporting uh, secessionist conflicts on their territories, so uh, through threat to their in territorial integrity. Um, what's happening, so by now, even the Georgian government learned that they should balance. So you can see how both Georgia and Azerbaijan were quite cautious in reacting to uh, the war in Ukraine, because by then, you know, they understand that unless you balance, nobody's going to help you if Russia decides to attack you. Um, so, uh, however, with the development of the war, and as Maxime also managed, uh, to uh, correctly um, stress that there are opportunistic governments, and I mean mainly smaller governments rather than big governments in terms of they follow, they watch uh, where the power, bal power uh, balance power of power goes. And I think the greater awareness that Russia is losing this war and it's uh, more um, turning into uh, it's uh, leading to its isolation, great isolation, but also the importance which these countries now see um, the EU and the US is um, uh, uh, giving them this importance as alternative energy suppliers. I think it makes them more confident in. Uh, uh, expressing their support, more obvious support for Ukraine than for Russia. So I think they are feeling now more confident exactly because they see the increasing role of theirs um, in uh, as al alternative sources of supplies. And I think even NATO has a sort of greater legitimacy for intervention if the critical infrastructure is threatened. So I think probably these countries even feel more protected um, now uh, if they become the critical uh, alternative uh, sources of energy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leila. Now I was muted. Uh, and uh, Eugeniusz. Eugeniusz Smolar, please. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, I think, um, point one, it would be wrong to compare Finland and Sweden with Ukraine in the context of NATO membership. Uh, Sweden has cooperated with NATO, but particularly with the United States, for decades, since 1945. Uh, Prime Minister, Social Democratic Prime Minister Erlander was known to have visited secretly NATO headquarters in the 53-54. Olof Palme, who was not already a prime minister, was found out at the Atlanta airport bringing the luggage with plenty of US dollars to support some pro, common pro-defense activities and support his party. It's just, it's not a joke. Uh, but the fact that he didn't land in jail says a lot about the Swedes' attitude at that time. It was in the 70s. Uh, in NATO war plans, Sweden was always considered a friendly land in a possible conflict with Russia. Finland, on the other hand, has developed gradually relationship, but did it on a massive scale. In 2007, Finland has already purchased, with the agreement, of course, of the president and of the Congress, air-to-surface missiles, which could reach 450 kilometers, that means Kaliningrad, very powerful things that could strike deep in the Russian territory. In 2015, Helsinki struck a deal, deal with Lockheed Martin of buying 240 very powerful missiles, both ship to ground and air to ground missiles. This year, in February, the US has approved the sale of 12 F-35 modern jets and 200 offensive and defensive harpoon missiles to Finland. I mean, this shows you um, the development of the country uh, accused of uh, acting along the Finlandization line. It was not the case already since the beginning of the 2000s. But interesting thing is that in the case of Finland and Sweden, 
Moscow did not re react. Well, of course, it has shown some unhappiness. I remember President Medvedev, you remember this president who said something that it will be it was detrimental to Finland's interest, but nothing more. And that shows the difference between Finland, Sweden, and Ukraine. Not different from the point of view of the West, but from, from the point of view of how the West sees the, uh, the, 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 the outlook, the world outlook from the Moscow's point of view. I will just remind you that in the interview, Christopher Huygen, the closest collaborator for 12 years of Angela Merkel, in an interview in the Spiegel, he said, Angela Merkel never lost sight of what were Putin's red lights. This was very interesting because he's a man who really knows. And this is not just about Germany. It's about uh, as much about France, about Belgium and some other countries. So point two, there are many in the, there were many in the past and there are many today who believe that NATO enlargement was wrong and is wrong in the case of Ukraine because the important, the most important things are relations with, with, with Russia. Now, this is something which our Ukrainian friends have always to keep in mind. That means in the case of relation between nuclear powers, stability and predictability is the king. Not Ukraine, not Poland, not Czech Republic or whoever else. It's just a question of basic security and certain responsibility whether we will have the world to live in if it's not being controlled some other. Let me remind our Ukrainian friends, President George Bush Sr. came to uh, Ukraine in, 19, in August 1991 just three weeks before the independence referendum. And he delivered something which was called Chicken Kiev speech, in which he appealed to the Ukrainians to abandon the, I quote, nationalistic dreams and remain within the USSR. That was such a shock in, in, in the region. Of course, Ukrainians didn't listen to him and they voted as they voted for independence, etc. But it tells you something about the bottom line of um, uh, nuclear powers politics. That means Ukraine will not be member of NATO anytime soon. Full stop. And all the discussion is, uh, in my mind, uh, has grants, it prepares us emotionally. We push for membership, but we just do, we just push. And um, Ukraine, since 1991, was not on Washington's radar screen at all. And the proof in the pudding is 2014 annexation of Crimea. Well, war in Georgia is one. Annexation of Crimea and, the, and, and Donbass in 2014. Because they believed, not only in terms of responsibility for the future of the planet, but also that the Putin's objectives are limited and could be contained, like in the case of 2008 war in Georgia. And only, only the February Russian aggression has changed everything, mainly because of the heroic uh, fight uh, and suffering of the Ukrainians, but also because of the Russian brutality that made uh, even the most skeptical realize that this is not about traditional politics by other means. It is something more. It is something that needs to be contained, not only in Ukraine's interest, but in the West interest as well. So the objectives of cooperative relations with Moscow has been abandoned, more in Washington, less in some parts of uh, Western Europe. But as the US is in the driving seat, one could sense a wait and see attitude in, in, in some parts of Europe. However, at the moment, we all share the objective of limiting Moscow's freedom of action, particularly when they realize that the Russian army is not 10 feet high, as Maxim has said. Remember at the beginning, Bush has said what the United States will not do, not what it will do. That will give you a food for thought. So the, the war 
is dramatic, the suffering is immense, but it gave Ukraine for the first time an independent and prominent role in the geopolitical scheme of things. For the first time, I would say, but it does not mean that Ukraine will be on the way to NATO membership anytime soon. Thank you. I'm sorry for my pessimistic or realistic attitude, but I read Andrea's um, uh, articles that fight for regional security, Poland and Ukraine finding everybody else, you know, and NATO membership. So I think I should deliver some kind of a, uh, some kind of a picture that is not all that optimistic. Thank you very much, uh, Eugeniusz. Uh, I must admit that uh, to, to, a, to, to a large extent, I unfortunately agree with uh, Eugeniusz. Uh, I'm not uh, saying now uh, whether this is just or, or not just. I'm just saying that the certain pessimism uh, is something that I, that I share, unfortunately. But I would like, I don't want to talk too much because I do, we, I do see that we have more comments from Andreas first and then from uh, Alexandre. And I would definitely like to, to hear them. Uh, um, Andreas, uh, why, why don't you start? With regard to Finland, one can, of course, here see different phases in the post-war history under Kekon. And there was one sort of Finnish uh, policy. And, and as you rightly uh, pointed out now, and as I indicated at the beginning, now it doesn't actually in the last years, the geopolitical substantive change of um, Sweden and Finland is not that, that large anymore because of this uh, uh, also Finnish now um, uh, close cooperation with not, not only Swedish, but Finnish close cooperation with the other Western powers. So this, the sort of the Finland uh, that, that, people referred to when they spoke about Finlandization was already non-existent for many years. Um, so that I think that was uh, very well said by Eugenius. I think uh, I'm also agreeing here with, 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 with you that NATO accession is, is far away. I'm also afraid EU accession is far away for slightly different reasons. I'm also now, and I wonder what Eugenius and others say here about um, this sort of intermarium idea that there could be some sort of East European alliance. My, my impression is now that this has also moved further away, that this is also something that uh, perhaps was possible before February or let's say before 2014, some sort of um, something on the model of the Turkish Az Azeri agreement of 2010, um, a sort of um, a military pact going beyond NATO with a, with a country in, a, in the gray zone. I think that is now perhaps uh, too risky uh, for even for countries like Poland. And the, and the one thing that now emerges, the, the only model uh, I see now for Ukraine is what is in Ukraine usually called the Israeli model. It's basically arm yourself uh, as much as possible and, um, you know, and then survive in this dangerous uh, situation on your, with the help of Western partners, but not being included in any Western system of security for the time being. Thank you, Andreas. Alexander, now we are not in the car uh, anymore. Yes. Uh, in the street, no, no, but we can yeah. hear you and, and see you well. Yeah, okay. So I, my brief reaction on what Eugeniusz said was, oh, uh, so this is a big rationally uh, when uh, we say that this is not the case for Ukraine to join NATO soon. But look, um, this is uh, ju just to clarify, neither me nor any of my colleagues really have an illusion that Ukraine will join NATO soon, meaning in the nearest years. So this is not even the issue to debate. Uh, and the realistic expectation is also the very important element of of our success. At the same time, does it really mean that we have to remove NATO ambition from our agenda? Because that will be a real debate. Uh, my opinion, no, it's not, it's not possible and it's not 
needed, it would be a huge mistake if Ukraine says, okay, as soon as we cannot join immediately, we need to stop with this. It will be disastrous for Ukraine. The situation is not favorable today uh, on uh, accession. But at the same time, Eugenius, you know me well, long time. For example, I started my advocacy for the EU accession of Ukraine probably 25 years ago. I and remember. All, and all, all, these, all these 25 years, I have heard, especially from Germans, from French people, the only one point that you have, frankly, no chance. You, uh, Europe will not be able to extend. You will, uh, you, you, this is something which is not realistic. You do not have even a perspective uh, to, to become a candidate. But then look what happened. If someone would tell me just on the 1st of January this year that Ukraine will become a candidate of the EU, I would say this person is crazy. If someone would tell me on the 1st of January this year that Sweden and Finland become a NATO member states in June, I would say this person is crazy. So we should not never, we should not say never. We should not say in desperate, desperate. So I understand that there is not a post prospect for, for the immediate future. But once there is a willingness of the society, once there is a willingness of people, someday there will be a moment when then it will be accomplished. And this is very important to be strong and sustainable and not change under the pressure of some uh, historical circumstances. And the uh, so-called realism, which we call, yes, this is not, available now, but it doesn't mean it will not be available next year or in few years. I think that the history of this year, the story of this year tell us clearly that something which seems to be impossible may become possible. And I think that the, the, the further steps of, we do not even foresee what circumstances will change. Maybe something significantly will change in the Eastern Europe. And we do not know this, but we have to be prepared that at certain moment, there will be another reality in which Ukraine, Georgia, maybe Moldova will become viable candidates for NATO accession. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, those are very important arguments. And at the same time, I must admit, and I would like to, to, to ask um, uh, all the panelists uh, about it when, uh, af after Eugeniusz will take the floor, this will be probably a very good uh, idea for the conclusion of our debate. Uh, so, so my question will be, uh, you, you can already reflect on it, uh, to what extent what we are talking about, what this, uh, what this uh, discussion has, uh, has led us to, namely, it looks as if the consequence, the long-term consequence of the current NATO enlargement, of the enlargement by uh, Finland and Sweden, is understood, might be in this, understood differently in the Western Europe, or Western world and uh, in the in the world of of, of Russia's neighbors, namely uh, for for uh, for for Western world, this is quite an obvious step with two countries that have cooperated with NATO anyway, uh, especially uh, as 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 uh, was underlining with Sweden. Uh, however, for the Russia's neighbors, uh, this enlargement is like an invitation to, uh, to, to more work on the, the future possibilities of NATO enlargement, uh, a further NATO enlargement of enlargement with the, with the new memberships or at least open way for, for Ukraine and Moldova. I think it's, it's fascinating because it's, it shows a certain change um, or a difference in perspective or a different realism. 
uh, in the Western world and also in in the in the world of of Russia Russia's neighbors. So this this will be my my question for the end. But I still wanted to give the floor to Evgenius once again. Uh, thank you. Just wanted to reply to Andreas, who is an enthusiastic supporter of the regional cooperation, and he supported the Three Seas initiative uh, with Ukraine and before the Intermarium project, etc. So I will say that the regional cooperation in all circumstances is very much needed and very much useful because it is like with the European integration. Uh, we integrate through practice of cooperation at various levels, but it has limitations. And it, as it cannot be an alternative, as some people have even presented in Poland, to the European Union or even NATO. Economic projects, just me remind you, has been mainly financed by the European Union to the extent of something like 70, 70 billion euros when, for example, the American involvement promised, not delivered, is at the level of $1.3 billion. This gives you the, the, the <laughs> relationship of things. Now, military links cannot, can have only uh, a limited character as they cannot weaken NATO and they cannot eliminate NATO guarantee to its members. In Poland, because of this wonderful co relationship now between Poland and Ukraine, there were some hotheads who said, well, we are going to create with Ukraine a new uh, federation, you know. Okay, federation outside of NATO, outside of European Union. Who will vote for it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugeniusz. And um, now my, my, my question remains about the possibility of existing two kinds of realism. Uh, the Western realism and the Eastern re realism, let's, let's call it, as for the reaction for the current uh, enlargement of NATO. And uh, I would like to, to ask uh, the panelists whether they could evaluate on that. Um, Andreas already raised his hand and uh, then I will also hope for uh, short remarks from Leila, uh, Maxim and Alexander. I think one should um, use the argument uh, Ukraine and pro-Ukrainian um, commentators should use the argument that uh, in the near future no NATO enlargement, no EU uh, enlargement towards Ukraine is possible and that's why Ukraine needs to be made able to defend itself um, and to get heavy weapons and to get heavy weapons not only for tactical reasons now for the current battle to uh, defend itself um, in the Donbas and in uh, in Kherson and uh, along the Belarusian uh, Ukrainian border and so on, but also in strategic terms in for this interregnum, uh, as I would call it, between let's say some sort of ceasefire agreement that I hope will one day come and the accession to NATO and the European Union when when finally then Ukraine will leave the. Uh, the gray zone, but that may be far away. This uh, um, this uh, inclusion of Ukraine into NATO and the EU, and so um, the solution here is to arm Ukraine, and then perhaps I mean that's um, my my feeling is actually that uh, the uh, the federation certainly is not possible between um, Poland and Ukraine, but there's now a certain osmosis going on between, especially Poland and. Uh, and Ukraine and also the massive military help in terms of um, the, uh, the budgets of the Baltic countries and, and the sort of perception in the Baltic countries in Poland, perhaps also in Slovakia and even Romania, that this is actually um, a fight for Eastern Europe's security that is going on in Ukraine. It's not just about Ukraine. So whatever tank or other Russian weapon will be destroyed, in Ukraine will not be able to move into Narva, let's say, yeah, or to attack Lithuania. Yeah, so I think this sort of perception of a common fate, which is, you know, we, we are back, basically back to the intermarium idea of the interwar period. I think that is increasing. It may not, it, it will probably not turn into some sort of institutional 
um, arrangement, um, perhaps not even something like the uh, already mentioned Turkish Azeri Treaty of 2010. But I think the, the factor will, will remain or may even increase that this sort of perception of a common fate here, and this, this is not just the Ukrainian Russian war, but this is um, uh, something larger here and and therefore the solidarity um, uh, is is needed and you know for, for a country like Estonia it makes totally total sense to 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 transport you know a large part of its uh, military technology to uh, to Ukraine because as I said the the weapons that are going to be used in Ukraine against the Russian army uh, protect actually Estonia you could argue so I think this sort of thinking uh, once we get to that then um, there may be actually, we can we can have security for Ukraine in the future without an enlargement of, um, or before the enlargement of NATO and, and uh, the European Union. Thank you so much. May I ask you, Leila? So we would go in the in the uh, in the same order as uh, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And my conclusion would be, it depends very much on what NATO is capable to deliver or delivering in terms of security. And depending on the region, uh, it can deliver or, you know, the country, it uh, very much is perceived this way and the, the relationship uh, are also developing. I would say that in case of, uh, for instance, the Caucasus, um, Azerbaijan is also feeling more independent now in its security from Europe and from NATO because it's found, as uh, Maxim also mentioned that, I found the alternative. Azerbaijan has been uh, diversifying its sources of uh, arms supply, uh, arm uh, trade. So. Um, uh, it has Russia, but it has also Israel and Turkey as most important uh, partners in arms trade. So I think because of that, um, and the country started to find their own way to provide for security, I think NATO might be also uh, approach it in slightly different way and to see that uh, uh, the competition is actually growing. Uh, competition in terms of uh, you know, security organizations, multilateral ex organizations. And um, as we saw, there are many new actors who are quite active in this regard. So I think NATO should definitely um, be more aware that it, uh, it is acting in slightly different and more competitive in security terms way, uh, world. Thank you. Thank you so much. In the meantime, uh, I will ask Maxime. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, um, well, you see, um, uh, this, the story of invasion, apart from it being a horrible crime and, um, the cause for immense human suffering. It's also uh, an example of uh, an incredible uh, strategic blunder. And um, Putin's adage that uh, everything's going according to plan is of course a lie because in all of that's happening, there's almost nothing you can find, even if you try, that is going according to plan. Uh, if there was any plan, because he's been uh, essentially changing his plans um, along the way, and uh, that's one of his hobbies, to uh, essentially to, uh, you know, move the goalposts, as it were, uh, uh, during uh, during the game. Uh, so this 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 entire story is essentially uh, a bunch of uh, unintended consequences. This uh, whatever he wanted whatever he wanted in Ukraine. Perhaps, I mean, if we take this maximalist uh, plan, essentially take over Kiev, make sure Ukraine is part of, in some way, part of uh, this new greater Russia in, in an empire, whatever you call it, Soviet Union 2.0. But um, none, none, none of that is, is, ob is possible, it's, it's clear by now. Um, but his blunder has created lots of, I mean, a part of, uh, apart from being the cause of suffering and 
and terrible crimes there for which uh, Russia and Russians, me included, will have to be responsible for, I don't know, probably forever. So this is a, mm, the consequences of, of this war are permanent. Uh, I think it's, um, it's not something that, uh, you know, there is point of no return, or maybe it's something, a uh, point of return, maybe we can get some of it back. Uh, I think we have to, we have to base our mm, research and thoughts and projections for the future uh, on, uh, on this new uh, understanding of uh, essentially a, a new world we, we inhabit. Um, it may have all the features of the old kind of on the surface, but um, things are in flux. And in terms of international, I mean, it, it's changing in many respects, but in terms of international relations, we see uh, uh, Russia uh, essentially drifting uh, east uh, from the west and uh, Russia with its own hands uh, dismantling and ruining the work of at least two generations of uh, Soviet Russian and uh, European particularly German politicians been uh, building bridges and Russia is burning them uh, right now Russia is moving east and along the way creating all kinds of opportunities for all kinds of actors not just state actors, but non-state uh, as well. And it's uh, too early to tell to what extent we will see uh, things changing, but we will already see that uh, the kinds of players and actors on the world stage uh, that used to be uh, sort of muted and uh, drifting along the way, trying to find some opportunities uh, have these entire new openings in front of them. And uh, just to conclude, I think that, and, and it's, I think this has been mentioned here, um, how Ukraine's role has changed. It's changed immensely. It, Ukraine is now a, it, it is true that Russia was sort of a substitute for the Soviet Union, including for Germany uh, on the world stage for all, over all those years up until 2022. Kind of a, a quasi-Soviet uh, Union as Putin would want it, by the way. So that was the, that was the entire uh, intention to, to keep Russia. He even said that a couple of times that Russia is, is just, it's, it's the Soviet Union, just the name is different, something like that. Uh, so basically that has changed too. So. Uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, we will have to, or I will try to compile this entire list of unintended consequences of this, but it will be long. And um, we, I think it would be a very good idea to start thinking about the situation as if everything's changed, because it is, and it is uh, sort of the, the little things that we can only, see now just in some of the uh, uh, some of the phenomena that are happening right now they will get bigger obviously we cannot predict anything in any uh, uh, in any exact way but uh, it would be a good thing of trying to come at least mentally to create uh, gradually create a picture of the new uh, world order that is being created as we speak thank you Thank you so much. And uh, Alexandra is back. Uh, yeah. Alexandra, would you would you share with yeah. us? Uh, so I, I have nothing significant to to add, but um, the, you see that our our conclusion is that the really uh, the NATO enlargement or accession of new member states is is something which can be hardly separated from the rest of the picture. And so our debate is exactly about that. It's almost impossible to, deba uh, to debate NATO as a black box. It is it's just not. So certainly when we uh, uh, discuss or speculate 
what is the ultimate consequence of uh, uh, Finland and Sweden accession. Either it uh, has a um, direct uh, some um, influence on the future accession of other countries, or if there is some relationship with uh, Ukrainian ambitions to, to become a NATO member state. Not necessarily. So there, there is no, I would say, just uh, direct uh, linkage. So it cannot, for example, accession of uh, Finland does not give any direct conclusion on, on the idea of accession of Ukraine. It's, it's very, uh, uh, it's rather indirect. And there are so many indirect elements of this picture. And certainly we, we have, a lot, uh, have a lot to discuss. But what I have started with is, I think it's, it's still relevant for our part of the world. First of all, this is that the West some way returned and there is no longer Westlessness, which we hope so. There is also the indication that NATO is able to act decisively and in a fast manner when it is needed, when there is a extraordinary circumstances require this, which is also the positive thing. And also what we discussed before, the, the, this kind of erosion of the, of the perception of non-alignment or neutrality, which is very significant for any political debate in our part of the world, including the future political debate on the some eventual peace arrangement, which we are looking forward. So this is all elements of, of high importance, even if they are not directly related to, to NATO as an institution. Thank you. Mm -hmm.